Okay, Second Timothy for beginners. This is uh, lesson number one in this uh, series, the introductory lesson. Second Timothy chapter one, verses one to five. So I've already provided uh, introductory information on Paul the Apostle, and we did that in 1 first, uh, first Timothy, and also the young evangelist uh, uh, Timothy himself, talked about him in 1 Timothy, so we're not going to do that over again in this second letter, for this second letter. Uh, in that section, I, I reviewed the time and the circumstances of the first letter to Timothy, as well as the relationship and the uh, special bond between these two servants of God. They were like father and son. Uh, the nature of this uh, relationship uh, actually really shines through in 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy you really see how fond uh, Paul is of, of Timothy, how much he depends on him. Uh, in Paul's first letter he advised Timothy on topics of church organization and leadership roles and how to deal with uh, teachers who are attempting to replace the gospel uh, with a new gospel derived from a mixture of ideas taken from uh, various mystery religions, Greek philosophy, Jewish law, and Christianity, kind of all you know, mixed all this together and created a new gospel, a super gospel that they were uh, promoting. Uh, special knowledge gospel that only they had the secret to. Uh, this super gospel threatened the faith and the stability of the church, not to mention Paul's credibility as an apostle and of course Timothy's position as a teacher sent by Paul the apostle. So that was in the first letter, that was what uh, Timothy was dealing with there. The second letter is more personal in nature as Paul focuses on uh, Timothy's state of mind while he battles the issues and the people described in the first letter. So it also provides a window into Paul's own personal struggles and needs as he faces the greatest crisis in his long and fruitful service on behalf of the gospel and his care for the young church of the first century. So let's do a little bit of background for uh, 2 Timothy. The date, the book was written shortly before Paul was executed in Rome, somewhere between 64 and 67 AD, executed under Nero. His circumstances, uh, after being released from his first imprisonment, Paul likely traveled to Nicopolis, located in, the, in western Greece, and he planned to stay there for a while. We read about that in Titus, and we'll talk about that when we get to Titus. Uh, when the persecution of the church by Nero began, uh, Paul left uh, Nicopolis and traveled to the safer confines of Troas, as you see on our map, a little further away from the capital there, thinking he'd avoid any trouble. It seems that he was forced to flee from that city as well, since in the rush he left behind his cloak and books and parchments, probably Old Testament scriptures that he's referring to. It was around this period that he was arrested this a second time now and taken back to Rome for trial and execution. So it seems that Alexander, a coppersmith, may have had a hand in his arrest we will read about that in 2 Timothy chapter four. Um, he was apprehended shortly after the burning of Rome by Nero, the blame for which was laid upon the Christians who were disliked anyways. They didn't like the Christians anyways because of what they were doing, what they were being accused of. And so Nero, who was a builder, he, was, you know, he wanted to rebuild parts of the city you can't, you can't build unless you tear down, and so uh, he uh, conveniently set a fire to most of the city and um, put the blame on to the Christians, and that sparked a persecution of the church uh, in Rome. And of course, as one of the most prominent Christian leaders, Paul, who was well known in Rome because of, you know, he was in prison there for two years, and he went uh, before the emperor, to plead his case, to plead for Christianity as a legitimate religion. So he was well known in Rome, so it was obvious that he would be targeted in this persecution. Um, 
Paul's uh, first imprisonment was caused by false accusation from Jewish leaders, we know that. This time, however, it was the Romans who brought charges against him. A little different now. In his previous imprisonment, he was under house arrest, but this time he's placed in a dungeon. He's placed in a prison. No more house arrest, no more just one guard. No more groups coming in and out to be taught. Uh, no more of that. Now he's, he's, like the other, he's like the other prisoners. As I say, before he preached, he taught freely all those who came to visit and stayed with him. Now the visits are restricted and no one stood with him at trial. He confidently expected to be released from his first imprisonment, we know that, but has no such hope this time around. Again, in 2 Timothy, we read about this. He, he doesn't think he's going to be released. He's, he's assured that this is the end of the line for him. Uh, and this expectation of death gives urgency to his words of encouragement to Timothy and of course sadness as he bids farewell to a beloved brother and a co-worker in the Lord. Uh, the purpose of the letter, several, several reasons why he wrote it. First of all, to encourage Timothy to be faithful in his preaching and teaching even while facing death and that the preaching of and the purity of the gospel continue even in the face of adversity. You know, he says, look, I'm facing death, but I'm, I'm not changing what I'm preaching. I'm keeping the course of what I'm teaching. I am not going back on anything. Even though they're going to kill me for it, it doesn't matter. And his message to Timothy is, and any adversity you face, Timothy, you, you, you make sure you remain faithful and teach the, the pure gospel. Don't change that. Also to set forth Paul's final testimony for his own faith before he died. And then to ask Timothy to come and be at his side during his final days and bring along his personal effects. You know, he talks about the robe, the book, the parchments, uh, when Timothy is able to be with him. And so this is Paul's last surviving letter. It has been styled as his last will and testament. Uh, a couple of interesting facts about 2 Timothy. Uh, it's a very personal letter in that it refers to 23 individuals in four short chapters. It's a lot of people to refer to. Um, uh, only Paul's letter to Philemon is more personal than this letter here. Because most of his letters are not really personal, they're, they're doctrinal. He's teaching the Corinthians, do this, don't do that. When, you, when, you know, when you're taking the communion, this is how you should act, and so on and so forth. And then there are some personal things at the end, greet so and so, yeah. But 2 Timothy is much more personal than these others. Uh, one interesting fact, this is the only place in the Bible where um, uh, the names of Pharaoh's magicians who opposed Moses and Aaron are mentioned. We don't get their names from the Old Testament, we, we get them from, from Paul somehow. Janus and Jambres, he talks about them, 2 Timothy 3. Those were the ones that were you know, you know, competing with Moses, doing works ma you know, by magic, the things that, that Moses was doing to, to uh, make a witness to Pharaoh. As we know, they, they were kind of keeping the pace for the first couple of signs, but after that they, they couldn't reproduce what Moses was doing. So Paul names these two. Their names survive somehow through oral history or documents that we no longer have access to. Uh, Paul refers to Timothy as a man of God, 2 Timothy 3, 17, which was a title given to the great prophets in Israel. A high compliment. Moses in Deuteronomy and Samuel, 1 Samuel, David, Nehemiah. All these you know, talked about a man of God. Man of God was a prophet. So Paul refers to Timothy as a man of God. Um, in speaking of his impending execution, Paul uses the term already being offered, which in the Greek language meant that a, sacrifice, a sacrificed animal's blood was poured out as a drink or a liquid offering on a sacrificial altar. 
And so he refers to his death or his impending execution as that, that it was, that it was a life being offered sacrificially for God. And uh, Paul was uh, executed by beheading. Uh, as a Roman citizen, uh, Paul would not be subject to execution by crucifixion. Uh, Roman law said that you, you could not crucify a Roman citizen. That, that was much too cruel, much too degrading, humiliating a death for a Roman citizen a Roman citizen uh, beheading. And actually beheading was a lot less you know, painful, let's put it this way, than crucifixion. Crucifixion, it would take days for the individual to finally die, uh, excruciating pain. A beheading, well, you know, it was over rather quickly. So uh, unlike Peter and Jesus, of course, who were executed by the Romans through crucifixion, Paul was beheaded. Uh, based on the request made of him in this letter, we can surmise that Timothy followed Paul's instructions in collecting his things and he traveled to Rome to be with him at the end of his life and witnessed Paul's uh, martyrdom. Uh, there's no main theme, if you're going to talk about themes for this letter, no main theme uh, for 2 Timothy as Paul touches on a lot of different topics. You know, he's wrapping things up and consequently giving final advice and warnings about several things. Here's a breakdown, if you wish, for a possible, you know, a possible outline that we're, we're going to follow in our study. First section, greeting and thanksgivings, verses one to five. Encouragement and instructions for evangelistic service. Timothy was an evangelist. Paul is giving him some final instructions. You know, you're an evangelist, Timothy. Here's some of the things you need to be doing and remembering. Also, warnings and assurances for the future. That's what a father would do to his son, wouldn't he? Warn him about dangers coming, encourage him for the future. And then Paul's final exhortation, his personal testimony and benediction or blessings in the final, uh, final verses. So we're going to follow this kind of outline here. You can outline it differently, but we'll, we'll follow this outline you know, to give some sort of structure to our, our study. So we begin with the greetings and the thanksgivings. And we start with verse one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. So Paul summarizes his life, his ministry, and his future hope all in one verse. One single verse. He talks about who he is. He makes no reference to his past as a Jew or a Pharisee or a persecutor of the church because all of that was dead and buried in the waters of baptism where he, like all other believers, came out of the water as a new creature in Christ, a Christian. That's, all he, that's, the, only, that's the only witness he gives. That's the only witness we give. You know, we come before God, the only, the only, the only thing that, that we have to say or that will be said about us in judgment is, Here, here's Mike or here's Johnny or here's Harold, a follower of Jesus Christ. Enough said. You know, the idea you'll be judged by everything you ever said, you know, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, you know, Johnny's going to find out what I said about him. <laughs> At the yeah, no, because our confession of Christ wipes everything else out. That's the only thing that is known about us when we go before the judgment seat of God. We're Christians, period, that's it. And as Paul said himself in 2 Corinthians, what he hopes for, right? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. For Paul, the only identity he now acknowledged, aside from that of Christian, was that of an apostle of Christ, chosen and called by God. So this role and identity not only defined his life and ministry, but it also was the major cause of his persecution by the Jews. 
torture and threats of death by the Gentiles, and finally his arrest and looming execution by the Romans. This is how people interacted with him as an apostle and as a Christian, so therefore this was responsible for his suffering. And yet despite all of this, he in his last letter continues to boldly identify with the one who is the cause of his impending execution. He will not deny Christ even if it would save his life. His entire existence is connected to Christ, whether it is related to ministry or personal suffering or death. He only identifies with Jesus. That's his only identity. And not because he's an apostle, because he's a Christian. That's our only identifying factor before God. Paul's other reference, aside from who he is now, is what he hopes for in the future. His death is imminent and he acknowledges this by commenting on what will happen after his death. So he joins the two ideas in this verse together by saying that his calling to apostleship sent him out to declare the promise of God in Christ, which he refers to here as the promise of life in Christ Jesus. That life was not just a lifestyle, it was a spiritual and thus eternal life for those who are in Christ or those who believe in Jesus. So he's, you know, when you're talking about his life, he's not just talking about his life like uh, Monday I went here, Tuesday I traveled there, Wednesday uh, you know, I had some chicken. You know, he's, not, he's, not, he's not just talking about that, he's talking about his spiritual life. He's talking about the quality of the life that he has in Christ. And what is the quality of life that he has in Christ? Well, it's eternal. That's the quality of life in Christ. You don't, you don't define spiritual life by uh, your wealth or your position in society. That's, that's this life here. The life we have in Christ has one unique quality. It's eternal in its value, in its experience. So Paul begins his final letter addressed to Timothy by once again stating his faithful allegiance to Christ as an apostle and the purpose of his calling to preach the gospel and his hope for the future, eternal life. Verse two, he says to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So uh, Paul uses a, a similar greeting in this second letter that he had used in his first letter to Timothy. Some of the things are the same. Uh, the blessing is the same. Grace, mercy, peace. Grace, grace is the character and motivation that moved God to offer sinful man forgiveness and salvation based on faith in Jesus Christ rather than perfect obedience to the law. I've said this before, you know, when people talk about the plan of salvation and they describe the plan of salvation as you hear the gospel, you believe the gospel, you repent of your sins, you confess Christ, you're baptized. That's the plan of salvation. Well, that's not the plan of salvation. That's our response to the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is that God has chosen to offer mankind salvation based on faith rather than on law, that's the plan. And sent his son to die to make uh, restitution for all of our sins. That's the plan. That Jesus rose from the dead in order to prove that he was the son of God and that everything he did was according to God's will. That's the plan of salvation. Oh. How do we respond to that plan when it's announced to us? Well, we believe it, we confess our faith, we repent of our sins, we're immersed in the water, that, that's the response to the plan. Okay. So that Jesus obeys the law perfectly and offers His perfect life on the cross as restitution or payment for our sins, that we receive perfect righteousness as a gift based on our faith in Jesus, expressed in repentance and baptism, this demonstrates how gracious God is. 
He could have said, no salvation under any, any circumstances. You live your little life, whatever you got, 20 years, 50 years, maybe if you have some decent health, 90 years, you, know, you live your little life and then you're, you're gone, you're done with. You had your chance. Just be happy you had at least existence for a while. He could have done that. He could also have said, well listen, uh, yeah, you could have salvation. Make sure you obey the law. There it is, it's clear, you can understand the law. You know the rules. Don't do this, don't do that, don't lie, don't cheat, don't, don't commit adultery, blah, blah, don't, don't do that. Here are the rules, they're clear. Obey the rules, you'll get into heaven. That's the deal. And if you don't, oh well, too bad. You messed it up. He could have done that, but he didn't. That's my point. No, instead of those two options, he, he had a third option. I'll take care of your sins through my son Jesus Christ and your salvation will be based on your belief in Him and your continued belief and trust in Him right to the end. Why that way? Well, because the other two ways were impossible for us. And so this way, that's something we can do. We can believe and we can remain faithful until we die. We, that's within our purview, that's within our ability to do. And so that's God's grace in action. He gives us something that we can actually do in order to be saved. So he talks about grace, he talks about mercy, and excuse me, I forgot to mention, when Paul talks about grace, you know, that, that's a code word. That word includes everything I've just said. You know, it's all the gospel, God's plan, you know, it's all scrunched into one single word, grace. Okay. Then he talks about mercy. Mercy speaks to God's ongoing love for mankind and His blessings upon both believers and unbelievers. He blesses unbelievers with life and everything necessary to make life worth living. Unbelievers have families and comfort and physical and emotional blessings and beauty and abundance. They get that, we get that too, but I mean they get that too. He also continues to reach out to unbelievers with the gospel of salvation throughout their lives so that they might believe. He also blesses believers with all the same things that unbelievers have. You know, the rain falls on the just and on the unjust, we know that, Matthew 5, 45. But in addition to these blessings, the Lord also continues to forgive and restore believers who sin and fall short throughout their lives as disciples of Jesus. This is something that is not available to those who do not believe. I believe in Jesus, I was baptized, my sins were wiped away and my sins continue to be wiped away as I live my life. I'm especially happy for one particular thing. <clears throat> As a Christian, you know, we know in 1 John 1, 7 and 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive our sins and the blood of Christ, you know. <clears throat> And so as a Christian, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm aware of oh, this, is, this has got to be, you know, I got to do something about this, or oh, I spoke here and I shouldn't have spoken, or I said something, or I thought something, or I did something dishonest or ugly or impure, whatever. And I have the courage to, because of Christ, I have the courage to go to God and say, I'm sorry. You know, I, yeah, I, I'm sorry I, I did that again. And, and I'm not sure I can stop myself from doing it even in the future again. I'm going to try, but I can't, I don't know. I can't guarantee it. I, I'm, as, I'm happy about that, okay. But I'm especially happy that he continues to forgive me for sins that I'm not even aware of. <laughs> I'm not even aware of some of the sins that I do. Ways that I disrespect him that I don't even realize that I'm disrespecting him. That's especially good news, because that is completely out of my hands. There's nothing I can do about the sins that I do that I don't even know that I'm doing. And yet the blood of Christ continues to keep me cleansed. Mercy, that, that, that's mercy. 
And then he talks about peace, peace with God and self and others. Peace is the result of God's grace and mercy towards the believer. Why do I have peace? Well, because of God's grace and mercy. How do I experience it? What does God's grace and mercy feel like? Well, it feels like peace, peace of mind. A believer is at peace with God because his sins are forgiven and he no longer faces condemnation at judgment, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say for those who get it right <laughs> or those who never sin or those who figure out all their things before they die, no. There is no condemnation, that's the judgment, for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean in Christ? Believers. Active believers, I actively believe in Jesus. And a believer is at peace with himself because he can forgive himself for not being perfect. We continue to whip ourselves because we know we're not perfect. And so we go to the wall, we select the largest whip and you know. You see Muslims doing that, that's part of their religion, not our religion. They have, a, they have a festival where the guys go around and they have whips and they're whipping themselves and they're trying to make themselves bleed. Why anybody would ever want to be a Muslim, I, I have no idea, no clue. Legalistic religion to the nth degree. If God forgives you your sins and your imperfections, you know what? You can forgive yourself. If God forgives me, then I can forgive me. You can honestly do your best to serve God and live righteously without feeling stressed or guilty because both you and God know you're not perfect and you have allowed Jesus to deal with that imperfection at the cross. When Satan accuses me in my conscience of not being perfect, I point him and my conscience to the cross, period. Nothing more. I do not defend myself against Satan. Jesus defends me against Satan. A believer is at peace with others because his relationship with others is now placed on a higher or spiritual level. I no longer compete with or judge others because my task as a believer is to love others, not judge them and love them as Christ has loved me. This clear mandate for my expected behavior uncomplicates my life and it brings an element of peace to all of my relationships. Another element in the greeting that is the same, we're still talking about the greeting here, the blessing is the same that he talks about. The source of the blessing, you know, what's the source of that grace, mercy, peace? Well, as in 1 Timothy, Paul repeats that the source of these blessings is God the Father and Jesus the Lord. What is notable here is that Paul places God the Father and Jesus on the same level and in doing so declares once again the divinity of Christ Jesus. So that's the, another similarity to the blessing he gives in 1 Timothy. And then the third similarity, of course, the recipient of the letter. This is where the two passages differ. Both letters are addressed to Timothy, but in the first letter, Paul calls him a true child, referring to Paul's influence in converting him and helping him develop into spiritual maturity. In the second letter, Paul calls him a beloved son, which is more a personal, more emotional term. Paul is confined to a Roman dungeon awaiting execution when he writes a final letter to his closest associate and disciple, Timothy. In the letter, he greets this young preacher with a familiar blessing that encapsulates what they both believe concerning the gospel and uh, he addresses this young man as a loving son made more precious to him now that he is, of course, facing his last days. The contemplation of this loving and spiritually fruitful relationship moves the apostle to give thanks in prayer. And that's where, we, 
that's when he goes into you know, verse three and four. He says, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears so that I may be filled with joy. So Paul first mentions his state of mind while offering his prayers to God, clear conscience. Even though he was imprisoned and near his execution for a crime against Rome, his crime was promoting a banned religion. He felt no guilt for that. Like Jesus in the past who served God despite persecution and false accusations, you know, others in the past suffered false accusations. Joseph was falsely accused of rape and he was in prison, Genesis 39. Jeremiah was falsely accused of being a traitor, Jeremiah 32, and he was imprisoned. So like these servants before him, Paul suffered false accusations and prison, but he knew that he was innocent of any wrongdoing and his conscience was clear before God who he served. I may be in jail and I may be being executed, but my conscience is clear. I didn't do anything wrong before God. His prayers on behalf of Timothy, therefore, are offered with a clear conscience, which makes them acceptable before God. Of course, the idea is that Timothy, who shares this ministry and outlawed religion, should also have a clear conscience. See the point? I'm being executed for something both of us are going to be accused of. But I have a clear conscience, and he doesn't say it, but so should you, Timothy. You're not doing anything wrong. Despite what others might be saying about you or about the Christian faith, you keep a clear conscience. You know, the rumor was that Christians were responsible for the fire that destroyed a good part of the city. So Paul reaffirms that his conscience is clear, perhaps reassuring Timothy that there's no truth to this story. Paul's prayers are motivated by memories of his relationship and love for Timothy as a son, as well as Timothy's love for Paul. Paul mentions Timothy's tears, these probably shed when they were forced to part ways after Paul's arrest and imprisonment. In his prayer, Paul asks God to enable him to see Timothy once again before his execution. This, he says, will fill him with joy. And then one more verse we're going to talk about today, verse five. He says, for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am sure that is in you as well. So this verse right here, serves as a, as a bridge to the first major section of the letter, which is encouragement and instruction for evangelistic service. Uh, this is something about Paul's unique, about Paul's writing. You know, he has an idea and then he'll throw in a word or a, or a concept, you know, uh, which will stand by itself, but which is really a kind of a bridge to get him to his next, I, his next idea. Uh, in his prayers and consideration of Timothy, he's reminded of the thing that brought them together in the first place, and that was Timothy's faith and potential as an evangelist. Paul makes reference to the source of that faith, who schooled him in the scriptures. Uh, of course, both Timothy's mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois are mentioned, suggesting that Timothy had no male practitioners of the faith and it had been passed on to him by two generations of women who taught him. And so Paul compares Timothy, or Timothy's faith rather, to that of his mother and his grandmother, which was high praise for these two godly women coming from an apostle of Jesus Christ. I mean, he mentions them specifically as the ones who influenced Timothy and you know, eventually led him um, into ministry. Now uh, that the subject of Timothy's faith has been introduced, Paul is going to go on to provide instructions and encouragement to help Timothy's faith grow in knowledge and boldness. He's only got one last shot here to talk to him, and so he's going to make it count. And we're going to pick up his, uh, you know, this next section where he begins uh, some practical advice on what to do, what to avoid, what to be careful for uh, in our next lesson. All right, so I think we're going to stop right here.
Thank you very much for your attention. We'll continue with Second Timothy next time.